I am Matt Wiener, the Executive Director of the Administrative Conference of the United States. On behalf of the conference, uh, as well as our co-sponsors, the American Bar Association, the Federal Society, and the American Constitution Society, welcome to today's workshop. Unfortunately, the conference's distinguished chairman, Paul Verkeil, cannot be with us today, uh, but we're privileged to have with us, or, or I think we'll soon have with us, uh, several conference members, including uh, Caroline Fredrickson, Lee Otis, who's right in the front row here, John Cruden, Bridget Dooling, who I believe is in the audience, uh, Jeff Lovers, Ron Cass, who also happens to be a member of ACUS's, the Administrative Conference's Council, and I don't know if Michael Herz uh, will be joining us, but uh, I, I hope he does. I won't stand between uh, you and today's program except just to uh, say three quick things. First, uh, I'd like to thank a few people who contributed in one manner or another to preparing this workshop, uh, and, and none of them are necessarily responsible for its content. Um, first, Bryson Bachman of Senator Mike Lee's Judiciary Committee staff, Lara Quint of Senator White House's Judiciary Committee staff, Sam Simon of Senator Blumenthal's Judiciary Committee staff, Alex Givens of Senator uh, Leahy's Judiciary Committee staff, uh, Alana uh, Terengel, Kerngel, I, I don't know if I ever pronounce her name correctly, Amy Curran and Steve Seeger of the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Policy, Kanya Bennett of the American Constitution Society, who's in the back row, and a former colleague of mine, uh, Lee Otis of the Federal Society, Jeff Lubbers of American University, who served for many years as the conference's research director and continues to serve as a, a special counsel of the conference. Uh, and Stephanie Tatham, an uh, attorney advisor at the conference and counsel to its Committee on Judicial Review. The idea for this workshop uh, originated many months ago with Stephanie and much of the subsequent planning from the selection of topics and speakers to the compilation of CLE materials, which you may have uh, seen on our website, uh, was done under her leadership. Thank you, Stephanie. And I'd also like to stay, uh, thank the staffs, uh, majority and minority, of the House Judiciary Committee uh, for their abiding support of the conference's work. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's one member of the staff here, Susan Jensen, who's uh, sitting uh, to my right, uh, who uh, uh, has done more, perhaps, than any other members, member of the Judiciary Committee staff to get the conference back on its feet. A brief overview of the conference, uh, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. The conference is a small independent agency within the executive branch, uh, charged by statute with studying and recommending ways to improve the fairness and efficiency of administrative procedure. Our recommendations are directed, depending on their subject, to the president, federal agencies, Congress and the Federal Judiciary, in particular the Judicial Conference of the United States. The conference has no power to decree, only to recommend. When agencies, Congress, uh, and the courts choose to implement a recommendation, uh, as they often do, uh, they do so voluntarily, uh, and they do so not simply because uh, they are persuaded by the merits of a particular recommendation, uh, but also because of the unique process by which the conference adopts its recommendation. Careful study by an academic or an in-house researcher, followed by nonpartisan, consensus-driven deliberation among our members. Our voting members number about 100, roughly half are drawn from federal agencies, the other half from the private sector, the latter members represent a diverse array of viewpoints, which enrich our work enormously. Enormously, our deliberations are also enriched by uh, the participation of several classes of non-voting members, including senior fellows and liaisons from professional associations like the ABA, the federal judiciary, and other government agencies. None of the conference's members, except for the chairman, are compensated for their services. Uh, and that and the cost savings we often achieve for the taxpayers explain why Justice Scalia, a former chairman of the conference, testified before Congress several years ago that the administrative conference is one of the government's best bargains for the buck. A number of prior conference recommend recommendations address various subjects lying at the intersection of administrative and criminal law. 
They include most notably perhaps a 1972 recommendation that urged the U.S. Parole Board to bring its procedures for granting, denying, and withdrawing parole in line with some basic rule of law principles that had eluded the board's work. The parole board declined to adopt that recommendation and whereupon uh, then Chairman Scalia took the matter to Congress which promptly uh, enacted most of the recommendations into law. You can find that recommendation and all of our other recommendations on the conference's website. And finally, an finally, excuse me, an invitation to participate in our work. The conference purpose today is not only to facilitate the exchange of views on administrative and criminal law, which of course is itself important, uh, but also to identify subjects for future conference studies and recommendations on that and related topics. And we hope this workshop will inspire your thinking in that regard. Stephanie Tatham, Gretchen Jacobs, our research director, and I will be very glad to receive your suggestions. And with that, let me turn the program over to Lee Otis, who is the Senior Vice President and Faculty, v Faculty Division Director at the Fel Federal Society, Society. And as I mentioned at the outset, uh, she also happens to be a public member of the Administrative Conference. Lee. Thanks so much, Matt, and uh, thanks very much to the Administrative Conference and to um, the uh, committees of Congress who have been so generous in providing us this facility, as well as uh, to our co-sponsors, uh, the, the, the American Constitution Society. Um, I uh, am delighted to have my voice welcoming all of you here today. And um, I've been asked to introduce the members of our first panel on defining regulatory crimes. As usual, the problem with this assignment is that everyone on the panel is so accomplished that if I told you everything they've done, we would never get to hear from them. So I'll refer you to their abbreviated biographies in the program and to the links which take you to their online profiles. And uh, I'll just focus on a couple of their more salient accomplishments uh, that are the most relevant to what we're here to discuss today. Um, I'm just going to go alphabetically, and then uh, if I have people in the wrong order, um, Ron will straighten this out for me. Um, so um, Susan Klein is the Alice McKean Young Regents Chair in Law at the University of Texas School of Law. Among her many publications, she is the co-author of Federal Criminal Law and Its Enforcement, which is one of the leading case books on this very important topic. And she also is the author recently, co-author recently, of Debunking Claims of Overfederalization, which was recently published in the Emory Law Journal. Um, John Malcolm is the director, uh, and Ed Gilbertson uh, and Sherry Lindbergh Gilbertson Senior Legal Fellow at the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and he's also the chairman of the Federal Society's Criminal Law Practice Group. Um, in addition to his many other claims to fame, he recently testified before the House Judiciary Committee on defining the pro problem and scope of overcriminalization and overfederalization. Daniel Richman is the Paul Kellner, Paul J. Kellner Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Uh, he just recently um, uh, just recently, his, his case book, uh, his new case book, Defining Federal uh, Crimes, is, is now supposedly available to be purchased. Um, and presumably, uh, it will now give Professor Klein's case book a run for its money. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he also uh, recently published Political Control of Federal Prosecutions, Looking Forward and Looking Back in the Duke Law Journal. Uh, George Terwilliger is a partner in Morgan Lewis's litigation practice, and he's the co-chair of the firm's white collar litigation and government investigations practice. Um, he's also a former U.S. attorney, deputy attorney general, and acting attorney general. And it's a matter of some debate, of course, as to which of these is truly the higher ranking position. Um, and then finally, our, our moderator, Ron Cass, is president of Cass and Associates and Dean Emeritus of Boston University School of Law, and most importantly, for present purposes, a member of the Council of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Um, 
Uh, he asked me to introduce him by announcing that he was six feet tall and has a full head of hair, but um, uh, I'm going to let you guys draw your own conclusion on both of these points. Over to you, Ron. Well, I actually was six foot five and had a full head of hair when I became dean. Um, I'm going to start with one brief anecdote, which you will see is absolutely true, and it picks on the last group we're able to pick on in, in the world, and that's blondes. Those of us who began naming our remaining hairs are particularly fond of picking on those who haven't. Uh, there was a, a, a young blonde driving a car, pulled over by a police officer who turned out also to be a young blonde. And the, the police officer came up to the, the window and said, I'd like to see your driver's license. The blonde driving looked perplexed, uh, started rummaging through her purse. The uh, police officer said, uh, the, the driver's license. What does it look like? It's about this big, uh, rectangular, and has a picture of you. Uh, a few moments later, there was an aha and the uh, driver got out a compact mirror and said, this must be it. Because she saw herself, she handed it over to the police officer who looked at it and said, you can go, but why didn't you tell me you were a cop? <laughs> so uh, there are things that are matters of perspective. Uh, what we're dealing with today, the topic of overcriminalization and uh, its relation to administrative regulation, is one of those topics. We have had, in uh, the last decade uh, or so, we've had reports from the American Bar Association, the Federalist Society, and the Heritage Foundation all agreeing, and I just want to stress that these groups all agreed about something, uh, that there is a problem of overcriminalization. And the only things we have to decide today are, are what is overcriminalization, what is the problem, how serious it is, and what can or should be done about it. Uh, the speakers in the first panel will cover the degree of federalization of criminal law, the extent to which uh, criminal provisions have actually proliferated, pr grown a whole lot. Um, <laughs> The degree to which that's due to uh, statutory enactments as opposed to, uh, to uh, administrative regulations. The notion of deference to administrators, what role that plays in the sort of problems we have, and particularly where you have uh, vague or overbroad uh, criminal provisions. The notion that perhaps the problem traces to the elimination of mens rea. Those of you who uh, remember your law school criminal law classes, Remember that in the old days when you had a crime like a murder or robbery, there was a state of mind that went with it that was necessary to defining the crime. And at some point in the early 20th century, the Supreme Court began accepting the notion that that was no longer necessary for a body of regulatory crimes. Uh, the, the last issue that people will touch on is the degree to which we have to worry about discretion not just in the enactment of regulations that have criminal enforcement possibilities, but also in the enforcement. Now, there will be a second panel that will deal specifically with enforcement issues, but this is also something that relates to exactly how we ought to think about limiting the creation of crimes as the follow-on enforcement to federal agency regulations. The order we will go on is we'll start with John Malcolm, uh, and then Susan Klein, Dan Richmond, and batting cleanup will be George Twilliger. And after that, we will have ample time for audience Q&A. John? Thank you, Ron. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you today. So as the write-up for this panel uh, stated, the relationship between criminal and administrative laws dates back to the turn of the 19th century. And that's when Congress established early federal agencies and established a regulatory framework that included both civil and criminal penalties. However, as is the case with federal criminal statutes, regulatory offenses that purport to flesh out or refine the details of, uh, of a statute, uh, they have proliferated to the point where literally nobody knows how many criminal regulations exist today. 
While this in and of itself is a problem for reasons that I will elaborate, another problem is that oftentimes regulators end up expanding the scope of those statutes through implementing regulations in ways that Congress most likely never envisioned. And that creates risks for an unwary and unsuspecting public. Now, I want to be clear about something. I do not want my remarks today to be interpreted as an anti-regulation speech. Uh, I may have my opinions about whether or not society, uh, our society is overregulated. However, there is a big difference between regulations that carry civil or administrative penalties and regulations that carry criminal penalties for violations. And it's only this last type of regulation that I would like to address today. There is a unique stigma that comes with being branded a criminal. Not only can you lose your liberty and certain civil rights, but you lose your reputation, an intangible yet invaluable commodity that is precious to both individuals and entities alike, and then once damaged, can be nearly impossible to repair. Therefore, in order to preserve the moral authority of our legal system and engender respect for the rule of law, it is especially important that we be incredibly careful before enacting laws or promulgate regulations that can result in that moniker being attached to someone unfairly. Now, one of the underpinnings of our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution is that the government's legitimacy and moral authority to exercise power over us is premised on being, is, is premised on being based on the consent of the governed. This theory of government was highly influenced by English philosopher John Locke, who in 1690 wrote the following, the power of the legislative being derived from the people by a positive voluntary grant and institution, the legislative can have no power to transfer their authority of making laws and place it in other hands. Now, no less an authority than Chief Justice John Marshall, however, distinguished pretty early on between promulgating rules that dealt with important subjects, which was, dealt to, which was deemed to be an exclusively legislative uh, function, and delegating authority to others to, quote, to fill up the details. And the Supreme Court has held that Congress can indeed uh, delegate to uh, executive branch agencies the ability to fill up the details, so long as Congress provides an intelligible principle in the underlying statute to guide those agencies and to which they must conform. This is called, of course, the non-delegation doctrine. The fact is, though, that Congress often passes broad and open-ended statutes the results of compromise or to avoid making difficult political choices that might prove at some point to be politically unpopular. And these statutes delegate immense power to regulators. With two notable exceptions in 1935, the Supreme Court has held, upheld virtually every delegation to a regulatory agency, even in cases in which congressional guidance was virtually non-existent or at best nebulous. The reality is that today, unelected officials in a myriad of federal agencies promulgate regulations that carry criminal penalties. So many, in fact, that as I said, nobody really knows how many there are, although it's been conservatively estimated that that number exceeds 300,000. Now, although I don't want to focus on this one thing today, I would like to point out that the mere existence of criminal regulations dramatically alters the relationship between the regulating agency and regulated entities. All an agency has to do is suggest that a regulated person or entity might be subject to prosecution or criminal penalties for failure to follow an agency directive, and it is highly likely that regulated party is going to quickly fall in line without questioning the authority of that agency to act. In 2001, in Rogers versus Tennessee, the Supreme Court stated that, quote, core due process concepts of notice, foreseeability, and in particular, the right to fair warning as those concepts bear on the constitutionality of attaching criminal penalties to what previously had been innocent conduct. These are foundational elements, first principles 
underlying the moral authority of our criminal laws. Now, we all know the legal maxim that when it comes to violating a law, especially a criminal law, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. But anybody who looks today at the rows of library shelves that are taken up by an ever-expanding code of federal regulations knows that not only is this not true, it's in fact a cruel joke. Although some heavily regulated entities no doubt receive notice about what is and what is not uh, illegal and they're constantly reminded of that, that is not the case for many other entities and individuals who may wind up totally unwittingly committing acts that constitute crimes. This risk is exacerbated by the fact that many of these criminal po prohibitions uh, lack, as Ron just said, an adequate or in some cases any mens rea requirement or a guilty mind uh, requirement. Moreover, many of these, in fact most of these prohibitions, uh, are not malum in se offenses, uh, which are inherently uh, morally blameworthy, rather they are malum prohibitum offenses, which are not inherently blameworthy uh, and which would not necessarily raise red flags in the eyes of an average citizen who is not familiar with the contents of the CFR or who wouldn't understand the highly technical language or obscure subject matter of many regulations. For many people and small entities that cannot afford high-priced lawyers, these laws are largely inaccessible and incomprehensible. Now, I would posit that we have a serious problem when reasonable, intelligent individuals and entities are branded as criminals for violating a regulation that they had no intent to violate, never even knew existed, and may not have understood applied to their conduct, even if they knew of that regulation's existence. Regulatory bodies with guns and badges and little sense of perspective can take an unduly broad view of their own authority to enforce criminal regulations. For instance, Next term, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear oral arguments in Yates versus United States. An appeal by an individual who was convicted of violating the anti-shredding provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley, which was uh, enacted in the aftermath of the now infamous massive document shredding parties that took place at Enron. That law makes it a crime to destroy any document, record, or tangible object meant to impede a federal investigation. And what did John Yates destroy that led to his prosecution? Wait for it. Three undersized fish. Now it's true. Fish are tangible objects. But who can honestly say that a reasonable person would have been put on notice that tossing three fish overboard would violate a provision of law that carried the title destruction, alteration, or falsification of records in federal investigations and bankruptcy? Well, consider what happened to Nancy Black. Nancy is a nationally renowned marine biologist with a master's degree who operates a whale watching company. She also has a permit to research killer whales in Monterey Bay, California. On two different occasions, Nancy and her crew encountered a pod of orcas feasting on a dead gray whale. In order to film the underground activity, Nancy and her crew removed a piece of blubber from the water, attached it to a rope, which was attached to the boat, and then lowered it back into the water. In an unrelated incident, the captain of one of her vessels whistled at a humpback whale in order to try to keep it in the vicinity. And a crew member on the other boat encouraged passengers to do likewise. Nancy found out about it and reprimanded both of them. When the chastened captain's wife contacted authorities to find out whether or not her husband had done anything wrong, an investigator with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association began an investigation into the potential harassment of a whale, which is a federal offense. The investigator contacted Nancy and asked about the captain. Nancy told the investigator that she had a videotape of the incident, which she'd prepared, by the way, in order to sell to passengers that day as a memento of their experience, and she voluntarily provided that tape. However, she didn't tell the investigator that the tape had been edited in order to cut out extraneous material. The footage did include, by the way, the captain whistling uh, at the whale, but it, did include, it did not include the other crew member who was egging on passengers to do the same. Now, did anything happen to the captain or to the crew member? No. Nancy Black, on the other hand, was charged with two felony counts for providing an edited video to the officer without telling him it was edited and with two misdemeanor violations of the Marine Mammal Protection Act 
for feeding killer whales. The government, by the way, also sought for uh, forfeiture of her commercial uh, whaling vessels. Now, faced with the prospect of a felony conviction, prison sentence, loss of her property, and the fact that she'd already spent $100,000 on attorney's fees, Black pled guilty to a misdemeanor. In doing so, she admitted that she had removed the blubber and returned it to the water and that that was not explicitly permitted or authorized in her permit. And she admitted that she'd edited the video, again, for the passengers, not for the investigator, when she turned it over and that this could have impeded the investigation, even though it didn't. So a statute that was designed to protect mammals, but not impede harmless, in fact, potentially valuable research, was used to dragoon Nancy Black. Let me give one more example. Dr. Peter Gleason, a Maryland psychiatrist, dedicated much of his professional life to serving the poor and underserved. Dr. Gleason got into trouble when he gave a series of paid lectures about Xyrem, which was a drug that had been approved by the FDA to treat narcolepsy, but which was used by a, whole, by a number of physicians to treat a variety of other medical conditions. The conferences at which Dr. Gleason spoke were sponsored by the manufacturer of Xyrem. Now, while drug manufacturers were prohibited by law from promoting off-label usages for FDA drugs, physicians aren't, uh, are not restricted by federal law from prescribing an FDA-approved drug for off-label con conditions or for communicating with other colleagues about the efficacy of that drug to treat those conditions. Nonetheless, Dr. Gleason found himself under indictment for allegedly conspiring with some of the drug manufacturer's representatives to promote the off-label usages of Zyra. The federal government also seized all of Dr. Gleason's assets, claiming that they were ill-gotten gains that were traceable to the so-called criminal conspiracy. Although he believed he had done nothing wrong, in order to avoid the possibility of a felony conviction and losing his life savings, Dr. Gleason pled guilty to a misdemeanor, and he was sentenced to one year's probation and a $25 fine. One of his co-defendants, however, decided to fight. And he persuaded the trial court and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that the First Amendment protects the rights of physicians and manufacturers to convey truthful, factual information about the beneficial uses, even off-label usages, of drugs. Vindication for Dr. Gleason? Perhaps, but it came too late. Following his guilty plea, state medical authorities had suspended Dr. Gleason's license, making it extremely difficult for him to practice psychiatry in any state. Gleason became increasingly despondent, and he hung himself. Now, how should we address this problem? Ideally, courts would do one of three things to rein in criminal regulations. First, they could accord less deference, this is referred to as Chevron deference, to an agency's own interpretations of criminal regulations than they do to an agency's interpretations of non-criminal regulations. Second, courts could more rigorously apply. Okay, I'll be done in just a couple of seconds. Second, courts could more rigorously apply the rule of lenity and give defendants the benefit of the doubt with respect to any ambiguity in a criminal regulation. And third, they could more strictly apply the non-delegation doctrine to make sure that the agency received narrow and concise guidance from Congress. Are courts likely to do this? Don't hold your breath. There are, there are however, some things that Congress can do, and let me mention these very quickly. First. Congress can require regulatory agencies to identify all regulations that fall under their purview that carry potential criminal penalties and to make that list available to the public for free in one easily accessible location. Second, Congress can and should pass a default mens rea provision that would apply to crimes in which no mens rea has been provided. In other words, if there's an element of a criminal statute or regulation that is missing a mens rea element, a default standard will be inserted with respect to that element. Third, Congress should review and ratify, or not as it seeds fit, regulations that carry criminal penalties. Very simply, if a matter is serious enough to brand someone a criminal and potentially send them to prison, it is serious enough to be considered by those whom we elect to represent us. And finally, Congress should consider passing a mistake of law defense in which someone accused of committing a regulatory offense carrying a criminal penalty could present an affirmative defense requiring him to establish that not only did he not understand that his conduct constituted a criminal violation, but that a reasonable person in his position wouldn't have understood that either. Such reforms would go a long way towards ameliorating the problem of knowing and unknowing individuals and entities violating obscure regulations 
and getting branded as criminals in the process. Whenever that happens, the public's respect for the fairness and integrity of our criminal justice system is diminished. And that is something that should concern all of us. Thank you. I'm Susan Klein. Uh, I thought there'd be an overhead camera, but just in case there isn't, I brought some handouts. So I'm going to. Thank you. Do my Carol Merrill invitation? These will be on the test. This will be on the <laughs> test. I'm a law professor, so uh, thanks for inviting me here. It's been a while since I've been back in D.C. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be with a group of people who care about the criminal law um, and who care about federal law and regulatory law. Uh, I'd like to try to do four things in the next 10 minutes, although I may only get to three of them. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is situate uh, regulatory offenses in the greater scheme of uh, criminal offenses generally. Uh, and I think you'll see that they're a very, very tiny part of what the federal government does in terms of uh, criminal uh, prosecutions. Uh, second, I'd like to talk about uh, whether regulatory offenses are actually strict liability offenses. So that will require uh, trying to come up with a definition of what regulatory offenses are and actually looking at the code section. And in my uh, 20 years of uh, teaching criminal law, I've seen very few uh, regulatory offenses or any offenses that can be called strict liability offenses. So I think uh, uh, the, 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 there's not, it's not as bad a situation as one might think. One might be able to find a couple of examples, uh, which leads me into my third point, which is trying to uh, develop policy through anecdotes. I think it's a really bad idea, especially in federal criminal law because criminal prosecutors are often not permitted uh, to discuss cases. And therefore, you're really getting the side of the person who thinks he shouldn't have been prosecuted. And people tend to, to think that that's true uh, when it's them. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about uh, corporate exceptionalism, uh, whether we should be treating corporations any differently in terms of criminal law than we treat uh, people. And I, I think overall, we shouldn't, where, where we do treat them differently. I think uh, it, we're entitled, we, the, the people in this country, are entitled to greater regulation because corporations can do, can do more harm. Um, so let me go back to point one. And if you take a look at this little pie chart that uh, I passed out, it tells you what uh, federal criminal prosecutors are doing. Uh, what they're doing is prosecuting immigration and drug offenses. Uh, that's pretty much 80% of what they're doing. So uh, the regulatory offenses are 2% uh, of the federal uh, criminal code. Uh, if you look at uh, immigration, which is about 30%, drug offenses about 32%, uh, fraud offenses, which are about 10% right now, and firearm offenses, which is also about 10%, that's pretty much what the federal government is doing. Uh, there are some other small categories, each of them under 5%, uh, again, regulatory offenses being uh, 2%. So all of the, almost all of the time and effort of federal prosecutors is going into uh, these couple of categories of offenses, uh, basically drugs and immigration. Of course, uh, since 9-11, we have to add terrorism to that. Uh, pie chart. You won't see it there because the number of prosecutions are, are so minuscule. But in terms of uh, the, the money for, uh, for enforcement, there's now a, a, a big part of the budget is going towards uh, anti-terrorism efforts. So that's what the federal government is doing with most of its prosecutors and most of its time in terms of the criminal law area. Uh, and, and I think that's as it should be. We can talk about that during the question and answer period. Um, let's talk about regulations now, though. Uh, I've passed out a second handout, which gives you uh, a list of uh, 
what regulatory offenses uh, there are in terms of categories. And this is from the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. And it shows um, this, this chart doesn't go back to 1980, but in 1980, uh, the federal government spent about 7 percent of its criminal convictions on regulatory offenses. That has decreased to 2 percent uh, over the, the uh, in a few decades since then. So we're now at under 2,000 uh, criminal convictions a year uh, in 2013 for regulatory offenses. Well, what is a regulatory offense? Um, my kind of working definition is uh, a, a part of a, a federal law that uh, regulates an area, most often uh, food, drugs, public health, and financial markets that also includes a criminal pres prescription in addition to the civil regulation. And so most of the regulation is civil. And what you'll see is with a number of these statutes, all of the ones on this list, there will be uh, an added prescription, that's the criminal one, that will say something like, if a person willfully and knowingly violates one of these regulatory offenses, then that person can be subject to usually a misdemeanor a less than a year uh, conviction uh, up to uh, a felony, again, if it's willful and knowing, and in, in most cases uh, where it's particularly egregious. So we live in a world that is very complicated, right? We can't, uh, we couldn't possibly have 50 states giving us different uh, clean water regulations and different food, adulterated food and adulterated drug regulations and different regulations of the stock market. It needs to be done by one entity. It needs to be done by the federal government. And uh, it needs to have a criminal prescription, in my opinion, for the really bad actors. And there's a reason why there's only 2% only of the convictions are for regulatory offenses. It's really rare. The federal government does most of its uh, regulatory work with civil actions. And so the criminal actions are reserved for the really bad actors. Um, let, let, let me uh, respond just a little bit to the uh, uh, anecdotes that are given by the Heritage Foundation. I went on their website uh, and I looked at you know, their description of all these horrible things that the government's doing to these innocent people. And uh, you know, I, I, all I can say is, is look at these things more closely. So I saw 21 examples, about half of them were state actions, uh, actions brought by state officials, so I, I can move those all to the side. About a third of them were proposed legislation that was never enacted, so I moved those to the side. Uh, you're left with a couple of examples of uh, people who have knowingly and intentionally violated uh, the regulatory scheme. and. Uh, the federal prosecutor in his or her discretion decided that that, that was enough. Uh, now, in, in all of these uh, regulations, uh, I could find only two that allowed uh, criminal uh, punishment based on negligence. The Lacey Act and the, the Clean Water Act gave a one-year misdemeanor for negligent conduct. And I could find one true strict liability crime. There's one section of the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act uh, that allows a corporate criminal liability based on uh, uh, m merely sending out food filled with rat droppings without the government's proof that the person, the corporate official who sent out the food with rat droppings knew that the rat droppings existed. And the Supreme Court did say, you know, we're going to allow that in certain situations where it's a misdemeanor and where the health of the public is really at stake. Uh, we don't want to necessarily hear from the public official, I didn't know that warehouse was full of rat droppings. Right? He should have known. Now, you know, do we need a change in the law? You know, I think we could uh, change the, th the three regulations that I found that are based on negligence to uh, knowing. I, I think we could all live with that. I don't think anything would change. You know, I think that the people who were prosecuted uh, did know, you know, look more closely at their plea agreements and at, at, the, at the cases, and you'll see these were, these were bad actors uh, who needed punishment, who I think would have been punished even under a knowing standard. Uh, I also think you need to take a look at the, at the bigger picture. You know, finding two or three examples of people who claim they were prosecuted for misdemeanors and they got zero jail time, all of them, by the way, 
and who say, isn't this a horrible federal government? You know, I think we need to be looking at uh, regulations of the financial markets. And here, you know, no one's claiming that the, the, the few people who we have prosecuted, say for Enron or for uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities that are worthless, uh, no, no one is claiming that those people don't have mens rea. And there's where I think we really need to focus our federal uh, enforcement and prosecution resources. And uh, that, you know, that's where I see the department going. And that's why you see you know, a couple thousand mail fraud and uh, obstruction cases, but you see almost no, you, know, he, you can count on the Heritage uh, website the few number of prosecutions for uh, regulatory offenses against, against people. Um, do I have time to talk about cooperation? Right here. Well, maybe I'll, I'll save that for, for questions. You know, I think that the federal government is trying uh, to be most efficient in regulating corporations. The way to do that, I think, is pretty much what we're doing now, having uh, corporate compliance programs, allowing the corporations to police themselves and stepping in uh, only when, when it's necessary, when the corporation's done something that, that's so egregious and it so violates their own corporate compliance program uh, that we really can't step back. I, I do realize that there are some potential uh, pitfalls with non-prosecution agreements and deferred prosecution agreements. Um, again, I think uh, uh, the House bill now to regulate those w would be a fine idea. Um, but again, I don't, I don't see a problem. I think those with, uh, with, with the responsibility of taking care of financial markets and clean air and water uh, have to fulfill that responsibility. And uh, when they fraudulently don't fulfill it, you know, I, I see no problem with uh, using criminal law enforcement in that manner. So overall, I'd say we're in pretty good shape. I'd like to see a little bit uh, more uh, enforcement, particularly in the financial fraud areas. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, I do not have a strong normative viewpoint to get across. Um, I am a boring centrist. I have spent most of my life connected to the federal criminal law in one way or another, first as a prosecutor, then teaching. Just as a line prosecutor, nothing illustrious like them, like the here. But um, I still don't have strong normative um, views because we're still working out how this works. And, and just to remind you, I spend my time in some groups who make me think that capital formation in the United States is doomed because of, you know, zealous, overzealous prosecutors um, chomping at the bed. Um, other groups are sure that um, prosecutors are asleep at the switch and that, you know, all these titans of industry should be let off in chains. Um, I don't really go on either side of those. Um, but just sort of to remind you where we are on this, just think of the animals we have. Um, you know, trying to, to define what's a regulatory crime, um, tough. You know, if you ask the Germans, they have really good ideas of what is criminal and what is not. Um, we don't. Um, not just us, flip through Blackstone. You'll see what was criminalized back in the 18th century. Um, the United States has never had a firm line between what is civil and what's criminal. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's us. And if you don't like it, you should move to Germany. Um, next, um, where, are these, where are these crimes coming from? Some regulatory crimes are written right into the statute. Clean Water Act, right in the statute. Congress writes stuff. Some are the product of regulatory definition. Um, these are strange. There is no question that the idea of, of Congress delegating to regulatory agencies the power to promulgate regulations and then saying, and by the way, willful violation of these, statu of these regulations that you will promulgate are crimes. Um, there are arguments to make that, that these should be um, reviewed on something other than the, the straightforward delegation doctrine, this intelligible principle that we use, that everyone always passes. The Supreme Court has not accepted that. There's room for work there. Um, happy hunting. Um, it's been tried for a long time. And, and part of the problem, I think, is 
this isn't the strangest animal in the book. Um, when you think of executive agencies get to basically define elements of crimes, that's what the Controlled Substance Act is. Um, that's what AIPA is. Um, that's what trading with the enemy is. There are all kinds of statutes. That's where essentially the executive is foreign, defining what's a foreign terrorist organization. These are elements of crimes. Now, again, I'm not selling anything here. If you don't like this world, there are plenty of theorists who will support you in it. Um, but it is the world we live in. And it's not one that's just about odd regulatory agencies promulgating interesting statutes that offend corporations. Um, this isn't even the, the end of it. If you look at the Analog Substance Act, my absolute favorite, that's where it's not that you're trafficking in a controlled substance. You're trafficking in something that's substantially similar to a controlled substance, with definition of controlled substance coming from the executive. Again, I am not selling anything. This is an interesting statute. If you think that it's odd for Congress to delegate criminal lawmaking power to federal regulatory agencies, what about it delegating lawmaking power to the states? It does that. That's what the Assembly of Crime Act is. It does it to foreign countries. That's what the Mann Act is. If you basically are, are violating foreign laws um, in regard to uh, sexual offenses, that will be prosecuted under the Mann Act. And yes, there are interesting cases. Now, all of this comes back to, well, shouldn't Congress take the role, take the leading hand, as Justice Scalia would say, in defining crimes? Sure, neat idea. Um, it would make for an interesting world. I'm not sure it would make for a better world. Um, if you flip through Title 18 and see Congress's handiwork, I don't think you'll be spectacularly impressed. And I'm sorry, it's my host. I respect you all very much. Um, but Title 18 isn't much better. As a matter of fact, it's arguably quite substantially worse in many respects than administrative crimes are. Um, again, and if you took away administrative crimes, if you took a, there is an argument to be made, I actually would make it, that in the absence of the kind of specificity you get in regulations that administrative agencies are promulgating to fill out the field of what is a crime, Congress would basically make everything obstruction of federal processes. You know, basically generic obstruction of justice statutes, generic false statement statutes, easy to write, large amounts of prosecutorial discretion, not administrative crimes. Do you want to live in that world? I'm not quite sure. Um, once you do the math, in the, in the way the government works, I think it's a very good argument to be made for, for letting administrative agencies specify what's going on. Um, and in, if they don't specify, you'll have more statutes like the Sarbanes-Oxley obstruction of justice. I actually don't think it's weird to call fish tangible. Um, I eat them. I see them. Um, not weird for an obstruction of justice provision. Yes, it was in Sarbanes-Oxley. Many things were in Sarbanes-Oxley. The fact that it has this interesting, and yes, they may even be Five justices who say that fish are intangible. I don't know. I doubt it. I don't do some predictions, though. Um, and if they do, it won't be the weirdest decision they get in, in federal criminal law. Um, so let's move on. Because once you sort of think through what the problem with the delegation is, you start losing me. Because this becomes more a problem of sort of not what the statutes look like or, or where the norms are coming from, because they're coming from all kinds of places, and in many cases, better places than Congress. I think the real problem becomes in the, in the mix between civil regulation and criminal regulation that we have in the United States. And, and I don't want to trunch too much on the, the next panel, but just remind you, this is a very strange world that you all have helped create and live in, one in which federal prosecutors really have the freedom to range all around, either on the basis of agency referrals or not on the basis of agency referrals. Informal referrals, picking up the phone call, saying something to a prosecutor. That could be the basis for a federal investigation. Federal prosecutors are very much untrammeled in, in what they can do. Regulatory agencies are highly regulated. And this is strange. And it can lead to a world of of selective um, prosecution. Um, this is what Brian Cass and I were, were talking about on the way up. There's a culture clash between administrative law types and, and criminal law types. Administrative law types have this thing about the rule of law. We, we in the prosecutorial area have gotten over that. Um, I'm not proud. 
Um, the federal enforcement system is about selective prosecution. Every drug case you see is a product of a selection of a drug case. Every immigration case you see was a selection, out. and some of this is done at the individual level, some of this at the programmatic level. It varies. Every gun case is a, a, a matter of federal prosecutorial discretion. And yes, this is strange, and the answer is either to have fewer federal crimes or more federal prosecutors and agents. Take your pick. It, there's no right answer here. Um, but don't think that you live in this special world where prosecutorial discretion is really um, a threat in the way it isn't elsewhere. It's just as much when you, every single dime bag of heroin sold on the street is a federal crime, just to remind you. Very few of them will go, pre, will go federal. Some will. Those people will be surprised and upset. They will have no recourse. This is the world we have created. Um, so just to remind you, what do we do in the regulatory area? I think, and this is where I do think there's sort of a disconnect between two of the heritage um, principles. One is this concern, which, which, which John was, was right. You know, he doesn't want to move it into the wrong panel, but concern about overregulation. And you also have a concern about overcriminalization. These two things are actually in conflict. Um, you have, to some extent, in, to various degrees across various spaces, hampered regulatory activity. Um, what, you have made it easy to, easier to prosecute cases criminally than to bring actions on the regulatory side. And yes, I'm, I'm making huge general statements because I'm cutting across environmental, financial, um, OSHA. Take your pick. The stories can be different in every place. But you generally are seeing reaching out to federal prosecutors on the part of agencies who are strapped hard for resources, who are regularly um, have the phone slammed down on them by the people who supposedly live in fear of them. Um, so, in that world where prosecutors are going to be able to, in a couple cases, and Susan's got the statistics, and they're very few, but there are, and they are random, they are strange, um, and no one's going to claim that there's any deep theory here. But if you want a rational beltway between criminal prosecutions and agency action, you've got to fund agencies better. You've got to fund them in a sustainable way. When a, an administration that really isn't into regulatory activity comes in, you can't gut the enforcement action in that agency, leaving it to play catch up when a new administration comes in and have them send cases criminally because they can't support them regulatorily. This is strange, and I think people in this building can do a whole lot more to support the enforcement agencies and make it much more rational when prosecutors come in. Um, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you uh, to the Administrative Conference for the invitation to join this very distinguished group, and thank the sponsors, the ABA, the Federalist Society, and the ACS for putting this on. It is, in my judgment, a critically important time to undertake this kind of examination, and for reasons I hope to explain, to curb the trend of an ever-expanding use of criminal sanctions to address regulatory transgressions by business organizations. Um, please allow me to note at the outset that my remarks are entirely my own um, and not spoken on behalf of my firm or any client that we may presently or formally uh, have represented. A number of recent criminal enforcement actions against large companies and financial institutions, several loudly touted by the government as carrying record-setting penalties, have been big news on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other business publications of record. The Department of Justice and other regulatory enforcement agencies have extracted penalties in the billions of dollars in these and similar cases providing for gaudy statistics and impressive headlines. But if we pull back the curtain of public relations superficiality surrounding these matters, I think a less than desirable picture emerges. Should we not ask, for example, what is the purpose, the objective, served by these criminal enforcement initiatives and the so-called record penalties they carry? Do they, for example, deter similar corporate conduct that is unlikely, since these are not violations by criminal enterprises, but rather conduct by legitimate entities engaged in legitimate business activities that spend millions annually seeking to achieve compliance with legal standards. 
A better case can be made, in my judgment, that these results are extracted at the instigation of government officials responding to political pressure. For example, by seeking to quell the claims of a few that, that some banks are too big to jail, or looking to excite a political base that believes corporations are all evil purveyors of inherently unsafe products. Whatever the motive, it is objectively apparent that the federal government is employing very aggressive tactics and, and untested legal theories to stretch criminal penalties to cover conduct that is not in the nature of that which traditionally defines a crime, that is, conduct where the intention to do wrong is provable. Rather, the offenses here are grounded in conduct that is subject to the vast ream of federal regulatory standards that dictate and control business conduct in our highly regulated commercial economy. Before going to these examples, let me put my comments in context, though. Raising concerns over the increasing reliance on criminal law to punish regulatory offenses does not mean favoring leniency for real fraudsters, criminal organization, and downright cheats. The use of criminal enforcement has a place in protecting the means and instrumentalities of commerce and the integrity of markets that are essential to a flourishing economy. Those that would intentionally abuse the mechanisms of the economic system and do intentional harm to market integrity deserve criminal sanction. But regulating otherwise legitimate activity through the overuse of criminal prosecution is not a natural corollary to the principled use of criminal enforcement authority. Where in the use of their broad discretion, enforcement officials draw bright lines in vaguely defined regulatory standards, another very dangerous line is crossed. The prosecutor becomes judge, jury, and executioner all in one, because as a practical matter, no corporate defendant can run the collateral risks that accompany a move to contest such theories of criminal liability in a court reviewing evidence and applying the law. This is not some merely ill-advised legal or law enforcement strategy or policy. Rather, it is a course of conduct that insidiously stultifies the entrepreneurial risk-taking that is essential to a flourishing economy. That effect contributes significantly to an economy whose arteries of growth are sclerotic, and that in turn denies individuals the opportunity for a job, and as importantly, for growth and advancement in, in current jobs in a chosen field of endeavor. It's no accident, in my view, that the administration that brings forth these cases is the same one that presides over an economy marked by anemic growth and a general sluggish economic malaise. Even if one credits the concept that modern federal criminal law should be used to encourage corporate compliant behavior, that purpose is undercut by having post hoc criminal theories um, criminal theories applied to conduct in legitimate enterprise that could not have effectively been deterred or detected by compliance programs. When the application of criminal law changes, expectations change. But when the application of criminal law is ever changing, no one knows what to expect. Criminal liability becomes just another random risk, a cost of doing business. And that is something from a policy perspective we should never permit. Just a couple of the reported cases illustrate overarching uh, in, in the application of criminal sanctions in the business context. Just a few weeks ago, Toyota paid a $1.2 billion fine for an alleged fraud on the public. It is worth noting that this sum could pay the wages of approximately 28,000 full-time workers at Toyota's Kentucky assembly plant and is approximately three times the value of the investment Toyota made in that plant to expand production. And yet this $1.2 billion was, was paid to settle a single charge of wire fraud. I was a prosecutor for 15 years. The federal criminal fraud statute is used to punish a defendant for using the means of interstate commerce in furtherance of a scheme or artifice that results in economic loss and harm to a victim. What fraud did Toyota allegedly commit? As defined by the government, 
It failed to make timely reports required by regulation of instances of a sticky accelerator pedal determined by prosecutors to be a product defect. The Attorney General called Toyota's conduct, quote, a blatant disregard for systems and laws designed to look after the safety of consumers, and, quote, a clear and reprehensible abuse of the public trust, end quote. Notwithstanding these damning words, testing by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration never found any electronic defects in Toyota cars, and the sticky pedal issue has not been definitively shown, let alone proven, to have been the cause of a significant number of accidents. Regardless of the timing of what it said, Toyota, in fact, did issue significant recalls to address accelerator issues. Should the timing of making public statements regarding the effectiveness of steps taken to address a defect that is not yet proven be the basis for allegations of criminal fraud? In fact, is defrauding the public at large even an offense under the wire and mail fraud statute? The Department of Justice is applying criminal law in a way that establishes unprecedented parameters for what is a crime and companies facing responsibilities to shareholders and the outs outsized collateral consequences of indictment or trial are without a real opportunity to have such theories tested in an adversary proceeding. It is at least questionable that if tasked with establishing beyond a reasonable doubt the criminal standard that Toyota committed a wire fraud that the government could meet that test. For example, take one element proof of a direct economic loss by the public as a result of Toyota's public statements seems far too attenuated to show economic injury sufficient to prove that, quote, the defendant voluntarily and intentionally devised or participated in a scheme to defraud another out of money. That's the Justice Department's own definition of that element of wire fraud. Should not a novel theory of commercial fraud on the general public be proven viable in court before it is used as the basis to demand billions of dollars in penalty. The Toyota case seems to be not so much about Toyota's conduct as it is about the objectives of DOJ leadership. In his remarks in announcing the case, the Attorney General stated that the settlement will have far-ranging consequences and expressed his, quote, hope and expectation that this resolution will serve as a model for how to approach future cases involving similarly situated companies. In a second brief example of the overuse of criminal sanctions in the business conduct, uh, context, rather, under a statute meant to protect, not prosecute, banks, a financial institution paid civil penalties in the billions of dollars on the basis of merely alleged predicate criminal offenses. The government's theory in that case and others like it uses a section of the Financial Institutions uh, Recovery Reform and Enforcement Act of 1989, otherwise known as FIREA, that was intended to provide prosecutors with a way to recover civil penalties from third parties' criminal conduct that had an adverse effect on a financial institution. For example, where a mortgage fraud conspiracy undertaken by individuals outside a bank affects the soundness of the bank itself. Here, that bank's shield was turned into a sword used against banks. And what was the bank's crime, the predicate? According to the Justice Department, the bank knowingly sold securities derived from mortgages that did not meet underwriting guidelines. DOJ claimed that these actions contributed to the wreckage of the financial crisis. If that's the justification for criminal sanctions, then there are a lot of people yet to be indicted for establishing the policies that made marginal buyers eligible for what prosecutors now decree to be toxic mortgages. In these cases as well, there has been no testing of the allegations in an adversarial adjudication. Indeed, as noted by Assistant Attorney General Tony West, this statute requiring only a civil standard of proof but based on criminal allegations, allows the government to get, an get at an activity which might be very difficult to reach through other statutes. Or put another way, DOJ is publicly accusing banks of crimes, but avoiding having to prove them by using a civil enforcement statute that was never intended to penalize banks in the first place. 
Respect for the rule of law includes not abusing the authority that it provides to those who are charged with its enforcement. Unjustifiably condemning legitimate enterprise with the opprobrium of criminal sanctions for regulatory transgressions can be such an abuse. Aggressive tactics and novel legal theories may lead to short-term victories, impressive headlines, and political gains, but they make for bad law and even worse economic consequences. Thank you. We're going to take just a couple of minutes uh, if any panel member wants to comment on other things that have been said before we go to audience uh, questions. Yeah. John? I don't know. Well, I don't know if it's on or off. Uh, yes, it is. Briefly responding to Daniel, I would say, and I was a prosecutor myself for, for 10 years, uh, that agencies reaching out to prosecutors has far more uh, to do with the fact that they now have guns, badges, and criminal authority than it does any lack of resources by the agencies. And with respect to Susan, I assume that the site that she was visiting on Heritage's website to find these stories was the USA versus You site that's there. Uh, I would, however, to those who are interested, also uh, point them uh, on Heritage's website to with the, the Without Intent report that we did a few years ago with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and our uh, recently re-released book, One Nation Under Arrest, which contains many, many examples of, uh, of people subject to abusive prosecutions. And I would also just say, finally, that it's not that we're, you know, anybody up here is in favor of dirty air and dirty water. I mean, look, there are, for people who pollute, uh, pollute uh, administrative uh, and civil remedies, and if there is a knowing and willful uh, you know, a, a pollution of our streams and airways, then by all means go for a criminal prosecution. But if you think that only entities are being prosecuted and you think that only willful conduct is being prosecuted under these statutes, then I would also urge you to return to Heritage's website and see the video of Lawrence Lewis when he describes what happened to him when he was prosecuted under the Clean Air Act. Anyone else on the panel want to go? Uh... Maybe I just want to jump in and, and say one thing about um, George's point. Um, I think I think you're right. There should be more testing of, of government theories. Um, these companies should take these cases to trial. Um, I think that what we need to do more of is is tamp down the automatic imposition of collateral sanctions, and companies which which firms have all sorts of rights that we appreciate and celebrate. They are they are very interesting animals that have done a lot of good in the United States. They are also capable of doing criminal activity with very disaggregated um, responsibility. We should be prosecuting them. And we should ensure, and, and, and I'd like to think there's some progress on this, but, but it's been slow. Um, it shouldn't be automatic death, but it should be severe wounding if it's a crime. Uh, what we need is, is companies that are ready to take these cases to trial. I actually think the reason why these settlements look so weird is because they've negotiated. Um, the reason why Toyota has this weird one count wire fraud that we can't fathom is because they didn't want to go to trial and face, I assume, a couple hundred counts of something that some would think of with a whole lot more thought. Um, so yeah, we should do that. Let me just take one uh, example, banks, for, for example. I mean, I've represented banks in criminal investigations. The reason they can't go to trial um, or, or risk going to trial is because they'll lose their banking license. Even most recently, somebody's been quoted as saying, I'm not even sure we can agree for them not to lose their banking license. So it's a death sentence. I think Ben Lasky are in New York, the, the banking commission has been very good about working out with prosecutors some prepackaging of pleas. I think if banks are ready to plead guilty, I, I think things can be worked out just fine without death. Um, you should ask them. Let me go to the, the audience. Uh, are there questions you have for the panel? And remember, we have a lot of law professors here. So if you don't ask <laughs> us questions, we will ask you questions. Yeah, we'll do that. What's your favorite statute? Yeah, obviously, you've answered everything they had. <laughs> yes. And if you'd stand up and state your name. Uh, my name's Thomas Welch. I was senior international policy analyst at SPS. I'm no longer at SPS, so I can answer the question. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, the process um, 
out of interest of both sides of uh, the defense and the prosecution in the, the uh, pre-indictment stage and in the plea negotiation stage. It's in everybody's interest to have less transparency rather than more and to control sort of what comes out. Uh, there is a proposal, which I've been part of, however, um, to make both sides of the coin in terms of prosecutions and declinations of prosecutions a little bit more transparent. We read all about the cases the Justice Department brings um, in you know, press releases and so forth. What we don't see very much of is the cases they don't bring and why. And that would at least be a step in the direction that, that you're talking about if there were more transparency to that part of the process. Although I, I, I should say that the likelihood of that is going to be similar to the likelihood of my getting to six foot five. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, that's a great idea. Um, just as w when I worked for Rudy Giuliani, if it was Federal Day, once, once a week we would go into a police station and take whatever arrest they made off the street. Congratulations, you're in federal jurisdiction. Um, there was no notice, there was no process. Um, this, is, this is the way a lot of violent crime and drug enforcement gets done, although that was a little more high profile than usual. Um, one of my concerns is the more you make this an administrative process, and here's where I speak not as a creature of Washington, but as a creature of the periphery. I count New York as the periphery, which is... Which Most is, of America counts New York as the periphery. <laughs> okay, well, you know, you know Centralization generally, we found, I have found, leads to um, a lack of zeal with the center generally. I'm not, this isn't a, a Republican or Democratic thing at all. It's a bureaucratization thing. That the more you have a centralized oversight or even centralized reporting mechanism, which invariably an administrative process of the sort you're talking about means, it will really um, hamper zealous enforcement. And maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. You'll all have your views. But centralization should be taken as the equivalent of tamping down enforcement. One of the things that happens in the design of uh, regulation, and whether this is true whether it, it's criminal or civil, is there's a trade-off between the magnitude of the penalty and the, the likelihood that you'll capture the entire universe of violation. And I know, Linda, you had a, a number of statistics on the, the frequency of enforcement. Uh, is there any sense that you have that part of the problem that we're dealing with here in terms of selectivity is a problem because the enforcement is so episodic and, and probably by the nature of things has to be? I'm, I'm not sure if that question is directed at, at just enforcement of regulatory offenses or in general. There is a, a huge amount of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, I was a prosecutor for four years. I know most of the panel members have been prosecutors longer. Uh, and then let that be a warning to you out there if you ask the wrong question. We have a lot of prosecutors up here. It, you know, it, it, there's, I, I don't think there's much you can do about it. You know, the, the, the worst cases rise to the top because they're the worst cases. You know, they're the ones that grab the attention of the regulators. They're the, one that gr the cases that grab the attention of the prosecutors. No one wants to be the prosecutor punishing some poor you know, guy who works at a nursing home who's dumping all the crap, literally, from the nursing home into the Potomac. Right? You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy who's uh, you know, prosecuting. Uh, Toyota. Right. Right, and so the cases rise that way, and there's no, you know, there's no formal mechanism for getting the right cases. It is, it is formal. It is a pal picking up the phone and calling you, um, or a task force, or you know, that's how things work their way up. You know, maybe there's a better system for that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what it would be, and the system that we do have doesn't doesn't make me nervous because the the, the players, you know, the prosecutors have no reason to be bringing anything but the most egregious cases. Yeah. Ron, can I come yeah. uh, just yes, you a can. couple aspects? Thank you. Um, on the statistical piece of that, um, I very much appreciate Susan bringing those, uh, those statistics to this discussion. Um, and of course, they do have, they have value. But there is a, another aspect of that. The Justice Department, first of all, is notoriously bad at keeping statistics about what it does. And I say that having run the place for a while being uh, responsible as well as frustrated by that. 
Um, but we also need to realize that um, the weapons in the prosecutor's arsenal to deal with regulatory transgressions as crimes goes well beyond anything that Congress has prescribed in a statute. Um, if you take just the basic array of statutes of general criminal application, 18 U.S.C. 1001, false statements on a matter within the jurisdiction of a federal agency, 18 U.S.C. 371B, conspiracy to defraud the United States by impeding or impairing uh, the functions of a, of a federal agency. Um, 18 U.S.C. 1341-1343, the wire and mail fraud statute. Um, all of these can become weapons that a prosecutor can use in the regulatory context. And uh, to give you a, an example, there is a, a, a case that's one of my favorites, which uh, fortunately the uh, the 11th Circuit um, reversed the conviction of two men who were administrators at a hospital who consulted experts about how to fill out a Medicare cost report, got conflicting advice, made a decision, and then were indicted for the decision that, that they made. And what the court said in reversing that conviction is they can't possibly have formed the intent to make a false statement to the federal government because, in fact, um, they consulted experts, they got conflicting advice, they made the best judgment uh, that, they, that they could, and the prosecutors were coming along after the fact and deciding how to define the regulation. It seems to me that that fact pattern captures almost everything that's awful about the process. And those aren't just anecdotes, I, I would note with all respect, Susan. Um, those are people's lives. Yeah, I, I think that's a good example of the, the, the best and the worst kind of coming together. I mean, you note that that, that, that conviction was reversed because there, there, there was not fraud proven. And, you know, th this is the, you know, you, the fact that you can, you know, in the 2,000 mail fraud prosecutions, you can find five that you think might be questionable, and then you can find one that looks really questionable, and it turns out that one was reversed by the court. Or you look at the, a couple of questionable ones, and the Supreme Court tells us, well, you know what, you're right, mail fraud is too broad. It's only going to be bribery and kickbacks. So now, are we, are we, do we have a problem with prosecuting people for bribery and kickbacks under 1343 and 1346? I don't. So I see the system as working. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would respond to that by saying that the statutes that George enumerated, uh, you know, false statements, mail fraud, wire fraud, uh, essentially can turn practically anything into you know, a federal offense. I mean, there are very, very few fraud schemes other than hand-to-hand -hand transactions these days, even at the state level, purely interstate, that somehow don't involve mail and wires. I noticed the Department of Justice just revised how it's going to prosecute false statements, uh, false statements uh, prosecutions and raise the standard of willfulness. I think that's a very, very welcome move. But, you know, look, there are, it's practically nothing these days that doesn't fall within the jurisdiction of the federal government and prosecuting anybody for a false statement in connection with something within in the jurisdiction of the federal government is an incredibly broad statute. And specifically with respect to regulations, again, you know, people regulate bad outcomes. And, and I understand there are bad outcomes in this world. And there's a constant tendency to say, well, we're going to show you how really bad it is. We're going to attach criminal penalties to it. Now, if it's for knowing and willful conduct and the statute permits that, have at it. Uh, it's when it goes overbroad and says, well, just if you engage in conduct, whether you knew the law or intended to violate the law, and a bad outcome happens, that should not be subject to a criminal prosecution. There's a tort system, there's a civil system, administrative remedies, lots of collateral consequences. There are many ways of dealing with that conduct, in fact, dealing with it harshly. But branding somebody criminal is a unique moniker, and it, it doesn't really belong in our society. We have time for one last quick question before bringing the panel to a close so we can clear the stage for Senator Lee. Obviously, you've heard everything you need. I, I have to say, as someone with an administrative law casebook, I, I favor the recommendation that we bring back the non-delegation doctrine, because uh, I, I'd like some more modern cases to teach <laughs> than, than the ones from the 1930s. Uh, join me, please, in thanking the panel. <laughs>